Monday, May 7th. I'm Rim. I'm Scott. And this is Geek Nights. Tonight, we talk a bit about computer cases. Let's do this. Uh, most of the listeners may know that I take the train to work. I take the train from upstate New York down into Manhattan. I like how now that we live down here, what we call upstate New York has gotten progressively further south. Well, it's all anything that's not New York City is upstate New York. It, that's just what it's called. Regardless, there are many interesting things on the train. For example, this morning... I had to sit in the car which contained the bathroom. And whenever Uh. anyone opens the bathroom door on the train, it is quite odiferous. It seems like on every big train, all the commuter trains, there's always one car that smells bad. There's always one car where the AC isn't working. Uh, On the way home There's always the one car with the fat lady yelling into a cell phone. On the way home today, uh, there weren't too many seats. Except for this one car, there are plenty of seats. And I saw the car as I was making my way towards it from the previous car. And I said, that train is probably doesn't have air conditioning. And I went into the car, and sure enough, it was the hot car. Ah. And I chose to sit in the hot car, which was good and bad. Good because I got a whole seat to myself. Good because no one bothered me. Bad because it was hot. Uh, and bad because the hotness put me to sleep, and I almost didn't wake up. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I did... couldn't keep my eyes open to play Pokemon. I dropped my stylus at one point. I know that feeling. I was just tired. It's real easy to fall asleep during Pokemon, too, the way it plays. I know. My st- I just dropped the stylus at one point, and then I saved and turned it off. Actually, the worst thing was I was playing Pokemon like sometime last week, and I kind of fell asleep, and I woke up, and I look out the window, and I see things I don't recognize. Yup, and, and then you're like, oh, And I'm shit. thinking, did I go past Beacon? Am I on my way to freaking... What, New Hamburg? (laughs) What am I going to... And for a while, I'm looking like, do I remember that? I don't know if I remember that. And then you see something you remember. Yep, I saw something I remember. I've had that feeling many times. Well, the thing I saw that I remembered was Sing Sing. (laughs) Nah, you were way down there then. (laughs) Yeah, I was. Yeah. I fell asleep, you know, that you fall asleep for a second, but it feels like you were asleep for an hour. Yeah, it's like there's a lot of landmarks on both sides of the train, right, that you remember, and then everything in between those landmarks, you don't remember for shit. So if you actually, you know, decide that you want to figure out where you are and you look out at a time when none of those landmarks are present, you're going to be a bit confused and lost and scared. But in addition to that, I've, uh, let me talk about a different train, the subway train. You know, it's, it's not, subway is not the same as the commuter train. You know, it's underground. It just takes you from here to there in the city. You don't ride it for very long, usually standing up. But I've got a new game on the subway. See, I take the local train. And I look out at my new game is when I'm on the local train, I stand there looking out the window uh, of the door at the track where the express train runs. And about, without fail, about once a day, the local train will run next to the express train. And there's people in that express train over there looking at me. It's always kind of weird. It's not the kind of thing you get to see every day. Yeah. And I look at them, and I make sure I make eye contact and hold on to it. Maybe I'll make a funny face. <laughs> because there's nothing they could do there in another train. What are they going to do to me? I wouldn't dare make eye, maintain eye contact with someone I didn't know in the same car as me. Because Cause they might be a crazy guy. They might be a crazy guy. I if- made that mistake once. I was sitting there with some people on a subway train, and this guy is just, like, grooving to himself. Yep. And he looks up at me, and I don't immediately avert my eyes. I just kind of look at him like, hey, you were grooving. He was the craziest motherfucking crackhead. Good God. <laughs> yep. Guy followed me around for a while. Yep. So uh, I make faces at these people. And so far, I've gotten a nod and a smile. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to get, like, a, a funny face back, but we'll see. That's very similar to my very favorite pastime of whenever I see a little kid, especially if they're with their parents. The younger, the better. But as long as they're old enough to be at least semi-sentient, when their parents not looking... I'll make some crazy face at him, and I'll stop before they can get their parent to look. And the conversations that these little kids have with their parents involve, that man something something, don't bother that young man, or don't bother that nice man, or be quiet. (laughs) And the kid, and as soon as the kid's like, blah, 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 and the mom doesn't believe him, and then the mom's looking away, and the kid's staring at me, I do the face again, and they go nuts. (laughs) Because they don't expect some guy in business clothes with, a, like, a pager and a tie on or whatever to make a funny face randomly. <laughs> yep. <laughs> it's a fun game to play. 
Though actually, I've been having my own problems on the trains lately. Mm. With gas prices going up, more and more I'm seeing a lot of people trying to take the train to work. And they don't know how? Who don't know how it functions. And they get on the wrong train and they're fucked? Or they just don't understand and they tr- they're trying to buy tickets at the ticket machine and holding the line up. Or they don't understand how the ticket works. They stand at the door like, how do I give my ticket to get on? Or where's the guy to let me on? The guy comes and asks for the ticket and they don't know they needed one. They don't understand. They show them their credit card. They wonder why they have to pay more on the train. They bitch and complain. Yeah, uh, a lot of people do, don't do use trains often cause a lot of trouble and commuter people don't like them. Granted, I didn't know how to use the train once. The first <laughs> time I used a train and I figured it out. You get on the train. It takes you where you want to go. You get your ass off. The end. Make sure you get on the train going in the right direction, or you'll go in the wrong way. <laughs> if you're in Grand Central, you can't go the wrong way. You can only go to the wrong place. All right. So what do you got for me? So there wasn't too much, like, tech news, like, OMG, new products, OMG, new technology. But there was an interesting article some guy wrote. Uh, he, oh, great, some guy. Yeah. I think his name is Chris Anderson. He's from The Long Tail. And he says, basically, it's a pretty short article. And he says, you know what? Open source and Web 2.0 and things like Wikipedia and all this stuff is a product of boredom. People have spare cycles when there's nothing else that they need to be doing or required to be doing. So as a result, they dig things, they write blog posts, they write Wikipedia articles, they write open source software. And some guy uh, like rebutted him and was like, it's not true. There are selfless people who are working for the greater good, blah, blah, blah. It's not just because they're bored and have nothing better to do. And, uh, you know, uh, I think the problem with the second guy was that he sort of like, it's, he, he took the first guy as saying it's only a product of boredom. The only thing these, the only reason these things exist is boredom. And I got to say, I agree mostly with the first guy. Well, I think the problem is that the second guy takes the idea of boredom to be some sort of negative connotation. Yep. I mean, to me, boredom just means, huh, nothing I do in my life challenges me. I'm going to seek out challenges. Yeah, I mean, you know what we call uh, something you do when you're bored and you have nothing else to do? A hobby. Possibly entertainment. Possibly. You know, if you really think about it, uh, other people who are not, you know, writing Wikipedia articles or writing open source software, when they're bored... What do they do? They watch TV. Oh, so apparently those people are all right because they're not bored. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, it's like, you know, it, it's not bad to do something when you're bored because then you're not bored. If anything, I think it's really good that people are bored because it means people aren't worried about their survival. Yeah, think you of know, this. Their whole Laszlo hierarchy of needs is satisfied. The the bare fact that there are people in this country or in this world who have the luxury of being bored says, speaks volumes of how far we have come as a race. Yeah, it's a, I mean, there are even poor people who get bored. That's pretty damn good right there. There are poor people who are fat, really fat. <laughs> Actually, I just read an interesting article Emily pointed out to me about how there is a pretty much direct and clear correlation between lack of money and obesity. Yeah, because it's cheaper to get high calorie fast food than yep. it, and and less work, you know. See, I always kind of knew that, but reading the article, it's actually scary the ratio of calories per dollar in crappy food as opposed to good food. It's orders of magnitude cheaper. Yep. It's not just a little bit. Yeah, and the thing is you're poor, uh, you got no you got to work all the time if you're working at all. So, or you didn't get a good education and you're too dumb so you either you can't cook or you don't have time to cook and thus you have to eat the fast food i think money is more of a factor than anything yeah i don't know well especially considering that the money comes down to the corn subsidies and how there's a vested interest in making that food crappy food is not expensive you know it's more expensive unless you want steaks and things but it takes more time. You have to have you have to know how to cook and you have to spend time doing it. But see, that's it. the thing. It's still a cost. It's an opportunity cost. Yep. And the opportunity cost of healthful food is far higher than the opportunity cost yeah. of high calorie food. Yeah, I'm just saying that, you know, like the financial like paying how much money you have to pay to the grocery store to get vegetables versus to get actually you know, nasty stuff. Actually, while the nasty stuff doesn't nourish you very well, it has far more calories per dollar than everything else. Yeah, calories per dollar. Yes. If we're talking about, you know, uh, okay, you can either eat lunch 
at McDonald's, or you can make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich or two. The peanut butter and jelly sandwiches are cheaper and healthier, financially speaking. Anyway, so yeah, uh, open source and things like that are because people are bored and have nothing else to do. And yeah, I they mean, seek I satisfaction and such, and they spend their time doing things that uh, benefit everyone rather than watching TV, and that's a good thing. So there. Yeah, I mean, part of the reason we do Geek Nights is because otherwise we'd be cripplingly bored. Yeah, it's, I mean, you should have seen us now. Be before we did this show. We'd come home from work. Yep. And we'd watch a bunch of anime, play a bunch of video games, play a bunch of board games. Then it would be like 7.30. Yep, we'd, we'd still have, uh, we'd eat dinner. It would be like 8.30. Yep, now what? Now what? We'd poke on the computers, visit the same websites, and go to bed or whatever. I mean, now, because I have Geek Nights, sure, there's a lot of entertainment that's actually, because I mean, Geek Nights kind of takes a little bit longer than all those entertainments did. So now I've got, like, some unchecked entertainment. You unchecked? Know? We, you know how little anime we get to watch these days? I know. I got a bunch of unwatched anime. My I got Netflix a bunch is of, practically useless. My Pokemon are untrained. My, I got unread comics. I got Paper Mario only half beaten, et cetera, et cetera. But you know what? I'd rather have that than have all those things done and me sitting here doing nothing. Yeah. Granted, boredom is one factor. The other factor is definitely the fact that we're kind of egomaniacal, and we want people to listen to us, and we like the sounds of our own voices, but that that's beside the point. Maybe that's maybe that's Rim. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah, but... Uh, but what? Uh, I'm not any of those things. So anyway, speaking of egomaniacal people, there is a nation called Thailand, if, if you are not familiar with it. You might have seen the movie King and I, or seen the play, or read the, read well, the play. Well, in Thailand, they have a king, and it's a constitutional monarchy. And the king is protected by a law. And the law says that you can't make fun of the king or else you go to jail for 15 years. Yep, yep, yep. Well, uh, someone posted a video on YouTube. I don't think they're even in Thailand. Of the king next to a pair of feet. I didn't watch the video or anything. And apparently it is incredibly insulting to show the king of Thailand next to a foot or a pair of feet. Why so? I don't know or care. Okay. Because it, it, it's just one of those funny things. If that, anyone knows anything about Thailand, well, I know a few things about Thailand that are unpleasant, uh, at least modern-day Thailand. Well, the thing is, I could look it up trivially. I could click on the link in front of me and see the video, well, but I just really don't care. Yeah, I don't because really care either. when something offends someone else, especially if it's something like that, I care so little other than perhaps the entertainment value I'll get out of making a picture of it and then showing it to them. Yeah, I mean, if anything, if you're going to make fun of the King of Thailand, why don't you like do like King of Thailand meet Spin Remix or something? That'll, that'll work a lot better than next to a pair of feet. Now, I love this cognitive dissonance here because it says in the article that Thailand's 79-year-old king is universally adored by Thais. Now, I point out that if he's universally adored, yet they have a law that makes it illegal to basically not adore him, then I wonder how genuine this universal universal adoration actually is. It's hard to say because I could imagine, you know, a, a world in which, you know, they have a king and everyone likes him. Well, someone doesn't like him because they posted a picture of him with a foot on YouTube. Oh, no. Maybe they were just like a silly punk kid or something. You know? Yeah, well, the thing is, the king of Thailand, or at least the government, is seriously considering suing YouTube under these laws. Now... I don't know if they what they expect. Are they going to throw YouTube in jail? It's not like anyone <laughs> who runs YouTube or, you know, Google is going to just go to Thailand and serve time. Yeah, I don't think anyone from Google is going to be extradited to Thailand anytime soon. <laughs> Even though that Australian guy seems to have been extradited to the United States. Uh, I don't know details about that one. I don't either, but I don't I, like so, it. So far, the only thing I've heard about that is you telling me when I got home. Actually, it was all over the news. But. Yeah, well, we'll, uh, we'll have to get some info before we assume anything about it i guess it bothers me whenever someone goes on the internet and sees something that offends them or that is in violation of their local laws and they somehow feel that because it has affected them that they have the right to tell the rest of the world who doesn't believe in their bullshit doesn't have any law making it illegal to do this thing and doesn't care what to do if i want to draw a picture of muhammad hugging the king of thailand next to a giant foot I am perfectly okay with doing that because I'm not a Muslim and I'm not a, a citizen of Thailand. Yeah, I mean, laws are all about social contract. You know, people agree with each other to do certain things, you know, and not to do certain things because that's what the society is agreed upon. If some other society of people agrees upon something, well, they can all follow whatever they agreed upon and 
us people over here follow what we agreed upon. And if something that we do happens to fly over and bump into your society and you don't like it, uh, tough shit. If you do something that happens to fly over and bump into us, tough shit for us too. Now, granted, uh, not to say that I am in any way saying that cultural relativism is uh, uh, something we should strive for, because uh, there are a lot of things that offend me out there in the world that people do in certain countries. And at the same time, I feel very justified in being offended by those things and doing everything in my power to end those things. But if something is media, just media, and it is put on to internet, mm. you know, that giant wild west of Futanari girls running around hitting people in the foot with Taiwanese kings, there's nothing wrong with that. And no one has any right to tell anyone not to put it up there. Yeah, just if you don't like it, don't look at it. Yeah. I mean, granted, Thailand... If you want, you can be like China and filter it all out. Yeah, we know how well that's working. Yeah, I mean, it's it, you know, I'm not really too upset. I mean, sure, it's wrong. I, I, if I had my way, China would have, you know, a free, wide-open internet. But that's what China has done, and they're allowed to do that within their own country. And, uh, you know, uh, it doesn't really hurt me. So, yeah. Of course, also, it just comes down to the very simple fact that if you were ever offended... By something on the internet, good. You don't belong on the internet anymore. Welcome to the new world. Congratulations. The first two digits of the year are now two zero and not one nine. Luckily, wake it's, up. It's pretty easy to avoid things that offend you on the internet. I mean, if you're a person who can be offended, just don't go to any of the good sites, and you won't see any of those things. You just don't go anywhere. Don't I mean, go to FARC. If you just stick with Google News, you'll probably never be offended, except by actual real-world happenings. It always amazes me when I'll be on FARC, and there'll be a, a headline, and someone makes light of the fact that someone died due to their own stupidity in some sort of hilarious way. Mm -hmm. And then there's always that one guy who posts about how offended he is that someone had the audacity to make fun of something on the internet. That guy. <laughs> I want to meet that guy. <laughs> For all we know, it's just one guy. And he just has an account. It could be. It's a Spark. It's probably just a guy pretending. See, it's hard to tell anymore. Spark is so full of trolls, but not bad trolls. I mean, there are bad trolls, but also good trolls. That I usually cannot tell if someone is trolling or just stupid. This is why when I read posts on the internet, like text that someone has posted on the internet, I take the... the the collective body of work someone has written in their forum posts and emails and blog posts and whatever. And I consider that to be like a separate entity from the person themselves. What someone posts on the internet tells me nothing about the actual person whatsoever, and I assume nothing. The problem is a lot of other people do not follow this rule. So they'll like read something I've written and assume a lot of things about me based on their interpretation of what I've done or well, written in some forum somewhere. Granted, I can say this. If you've ever posted a comment on a YouTube video, you're probably a bad person. I've posted comments on YouTube videos. Have you ever read the comments on YouTube They're videos? They're terrible. Posting on YouTube is like pissing off a cliff and somehow expecting that to affect the world. That's pretty much what it is. I've pissed off a cliff before, though, so hey. Sometimes, Actually, sometimes someone gets wet. It's funny. <laughs> are you telling me that you pissed on someone? No, no, no. I, I meant metaphor. Okay, okay. Because <laughs> the two statements follow together. That one, you have pissed off a cliff, and two, it's funny when someone gets wet because of that. Well, I, I, that just reminded me of something similar. When we were in Israel, one of the activities we did on the pissing the, off cliffs. No, one of the activities on the trip that we did was uh, rappelling. Right. So we rappelled like down this hole on the top of a mountain into like a little cave and then out the side of that cave and then to the ground, right? In that little cave, was ba you were basically ankle deep in mountain goat shit. All oh. these little black pellets everywhere. Standing. Yeah, and that pissing on a cliff reminded me of rappelling into ankle deep goat shit. Things of the day. We had those dorm pranks a while ago and they were pretty good. And I was hunting around looking for dorm pranks at RIT, and I didn't find anything worthwhile. Oh, uh, RIT, so disappointing, not putting the dorm pranks on YouTube. So eventually, so I was directed to a dorm prank that hasn't made it on Dig or anywhere, and they say, we take apart this guy's room in 25 minutes, he left his door unlocked. No big deal, all right. So I figure I'll watch it, see if it's good enough. I'm watching, and it's a time lapse of these two guys taking apart a kid's entire dorm room piece by piece, very methodically and precisely, until they have emptied 
every single possession he owned from his dorm room. Wow. Now, in 25 minutes, mind you, that alone is a pretty okay prank. Because, you know, you can see a kid coming home. He opens his door, doesn't see anything. He'll pause and think, is this my dorm room? Did I get robbed? Where'd all my shit go? Like, I'm, and they walk out. You know, I mean, sure everything the right was room. gone. Like, they took his, his desk. And they, everything. They took his posters off the wall, all his clothes out of his closet. Absolutely everything was gone. So that alone is an okay prank. And I they wouldn't have been thinking That's the a damn material. good prank. Some guy comes back to his dorm and there's nothing there. Well, see, if I was doing the prank, I would have gone one step further and swapped two people's rooms entirely. Ooh. Because then they both come home and just never say a word about it. Don't get the reaction shot. Never admit you did it. Ooh. If they're smart, they just trade keys. If you swap them really perfectly and precisely, like yeah. you took pictures and then you planned Oh, I'm it. talking you put the garbage on the floor back where it was. Exactly, exactly. But anyway, this wouldn't have been a thing of the day material in and of itself. But then, about four minutes through the video, the coup de grace, the, the final point, the cherry on top, they show a piece of paper they have printed in color. And the piece of paper basically says to the name of the student, from campus security whatever. Due to drug whatever findings, we have confiscated all of your goods. You are hereby kicked out of the dorms. Report to whatever. (laughs) And they stick it to his door. (laughs) Now, that is just brilliant because obviously this kid was uh, a little bit because otherwise this wouldn't have been... It wouldn't have worked. I think what happened is these kids started out by stealing his... uh, (laughs) (laughs) And then they used it and then they got this idea. I could definitely see that. That's quite uh, a likely possibility. Now, we can't get the reaction shot because they weren't smart enough to put a camera up at the peephole. Yeah. And obviously, you can't just have a guy with a camera standing outside the door of the person you're about to prank. No, it doesn't work. Because then you're like, why are you pointing a camera at me, guys? But you do get a little bit of reaction shot at the end where they open the door after the guy's freaking out. And the guy's like, dude, I was totally freaking out. Yep. But he, they, he saw all the stuff in the room there. It was pretty crazy because the guys who did this actually made quite a sacrifice. And they basically put two dorms worth of stuff in their own dorm, making it impossible to sleep or do anything. They made a nice little slide out of it, though. Yeah, it was a nice, fun mattress slide. Okay, if you've been listening in recent weeks, you will know I'm quite the fan of the tower defense game. I've played one tower defense game, desktop tower defense. I feel that I've defeated it, and I've stopped playing it. I probably will never play a tower defense game again. Well, desktop tower defense game is probably still the best tower defense game. However, it's a little bit uh, rough around the edges, if I, if you will. It is the best because it allows you to make your own maze as opposed to just optimizing towers in an existing maze. However, it can improve in some other areas, and I do still believe a better tower defense game can be made. Well, here is another tower defense game that's not quite as good as desktop tower defense. But everything that desktop tower defense does not have, this one does have. And everything this one does not have, desktop tower defense does have. So if you combine these two, you'll make the best tower defense game ever, uh, at least so far. This game is called VR Defender Y3K. The theme of it is that you're defending a computer from viruses, and when enough of them get through, you lose. What's so great about this game? Well, First of all, it has a lot of interesting towers. Like, this has this nice flamethrower tower that's pretty cool, and the graphics are all slick and polished, and there's three different techno songs to listen to, all of which are quite good. And everything about it I like, and it has easy, hard, and impossible mode, and yes, the impossible mode is impossible. And this has provided me with quite a few hours of enjoyment at work. So if you're bored of desktop tower defense, this one will occupy your time for... Maybe a week or two. I, I have to admit, I watched Scott play it for a little bit, and it was highly slick. It was very slick. If desktop tower defense was this slick, you that would I'd be playing that one for months. They should make that game for the DS is what they should do. Ultimate tower defense DS. Winner. Oh, man. Tower defense games on the DS have to be made. Good fucking God. Yep. If only Nintendo would give us a dev kit. If only. We could get one for the Wii, but we couldn't get one for the uh, DS. Eh, oh, someone's going to homebrew a DS uh, tower defense game. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Well, there's been a lot of talk about me building a new computer. Uh, yes, the rumors are true. I did, in fact, order my computer. Head for the hills. It's the end of the world. The only thing I haven't bought yet is my new monitor. I'm probably going to get one of those super cheap on-sale Dell widescreens. Yeah, the Dell, I mean... You know, whether you're a fan of Dell computers or not, 
They have these really big, really good widescreen monitors at really good prices. Like the 20 inch wi ultra sharp widescreen is probably the best deal in the entire world of monitors. That's why, you know, at first I was like, how are so many people buying these 20 inch monitors that are widescreen? Are they like all rich? No, the thing's only like 300 bucks. It's, it's not bad. Yep. Well, the thing is they are kind of small, but they're high resolution. That's what it's all about. Like, for ex my laptop, right, has a 10.6-inch monitor. That's nothing. But you know what? It's 1280 by 768. Think about that. Think about how small those pixels are. It looks damn good, I can tell you that. It's all about having small pixels. Like, at work, I have a 22-inch monitor, widescreen, but the resolution is, like, 1680 by 1050. Those pixels are huge. So it doesn't look so great when you're up close. You got to sit far back from it, and then what's, what's the point? If the pixels on that monitor was as, were as small as the ones on my LCD on my laptop, that'd be the best monitor in the world. But anyway, one of the most important parts of a computer, if you're going to build one, and I guess it matters if you're getting one from Dell or Gateway or whatever, because a lot of them, especially like those Alienwares, offer special ones. The computer case is actually something you got to put some thought into. Yeah, also known as the chassis. It's basically, for those of you who don't know, you have a computer, it's a motherboard and a video card and a bunch of chips and wires and things like that, but you gotta put those things in a box. You don't have to. I have more than once run a computer that was literally a motherboard sitting on a piece of cardboard and a bunch of hard drives and stuff plugged into it just laying next to it. However, this can be problematic because, number one, your computer is not protected from the elements, so you don't want to have a computer lying open if you spill a coffee or something. You're yep. screwed. Uh, if your friend Scott Johnson comes over... Yep. Number two, the computer is not protected from static discharge. If, say... If your friend Scott Johnson comes over? Yes, if your friend Scott Johnson comes over, he might statically shock your motherboard from a few feet away after rubbing his wool socks on your carpet, and then game over computer. The, the case of the computer serves a few important functions. Number one... It protects the case from the elements, as I just said. Well, it protects the computer from the elements. The right, case does right. not protect itself it does not protect unless you have some sort of elements. meta case, perhaps <laughs> a, a case case, some sort of encasement around the case. Yes, okay, it protects the computer from the elements. God, it's like those people who have a nice couch, and then they put a plastic sheet over it because they're afraid of it getting ruined, thus defeating the purpose of having the nice couch. Yes, but yeah, if you don't have a, if you have a case... You don't have to worry about spilling something. I mean, sure, you might spill something on it, but it's not the end of the world. Dude, if you spill something on your computer case, what the hell were you doing? Yeah. You can also, you know, it takes all the components and it makes them take up a lot less physical space. You know, a motherboard with a bunch of hard drives strewn about takes up your whole desk. If you cram those things into a nice box, you can get them in there real tight. You know, and then it takes up a lot less space in your room. You can stick the computer in the closet or under your desk. Or Especially so with towers. Because remember, back in the day... Most computers were not towers like we see today. Most of them were big, wide chunks of things that sat on your desk and you stuck the monitor on top of them and they took up a bunch of space and they didn't take advantage of that vertical space. Yeah, a lot of computers used to have the like the keyboard, like an Apple II. The keyboard and the computer are part of the same physical thing. Or a Macintosh old school, like a 512K or a Mac Plus. The monitor and the computer and the disk drive are all part of the same. They're all one thing, like an iMac. It's one thing. And that took up a lot of room back in the day when monitors were big and keyboards were big, and it, it kind of sucked. Well, now that we have the tower, you can cram the tower somewhere far away, use extra long cables or even wireless, and just have on your desk a monitor, a nice LCD monitor, doesn't take up much room, a keyboard and a mouse, and have all the other stuff far away where it doesn't bother you. Now, the funny thing is, in terms of what kinds of computers geeks build, it, there was almost an arms race in terms of how big towers could be. And the conventional wisdom back in the day was get the biggest goddamn tower you can afford because you're going to fill it with drives. And nowadays, all those drives have basically become condensed into one drive or yep. two drives. But yet again, more and more motherboards are coming with RAID and more and more people are doing simple RAIDs in their homes to store their vast media collections. And we're going back to having lots of drives. Yep, but at the same time, while you're getting all these drives on the inside now, you don't need nearly as many outward-facing drives as you used to. I mean, the case I use for my current computer, my old one, is gigantic. It's absolutely huge. It has a whole bunch of open spaces in the front, the five-inch bays. And four of them 
are full of stuff. I got my CD burner. I got my DVD ROM. I got my zip drive that hasn't worked in God knows how long. Yep. I got my live drive. Maybe if I want a, uh, some sort of card reader that takes up another one. But nowadays, you don't need all that stuff. No one uses zip drives anymore. Nope. Yeah, back in the late 90s, like, the full tower was where it's at. You kind of needed a full tower, mostly because also a lot of motherboards are really big, and, and the design of cases hadn't progressed much because, you know, there were, the standards for how these things worked were new. Up, up until then, people just made the entire computer as a unit. The case was designed for the motherboard, and they, all these parts were designed to go together. And you wouldn't just have, you know, a motherboard designed in such a way that any case could have that motherboard, or... You know, any motherboard could take any case, and any case could take any motherboard, and any drive could fit in any box. But we came up with standards for those things, and everyone followed the same rules, and now it's awesome. Yep. I mean, you might hear things like, oh, it's an ATX, or it's a micro ATX, or it's a BTX. Those are the standards that cases use in order to determine what kinds of motherboards can go in them. Yep. So if a case says, I can take an ATX motherboard, well, any ATX motherboard will now fit in that case. Guaranteed, pretty much. That tells you how big the motherboard is, where the holes are for to put the screws in, uh, what kind of connector for the power supply you'll have. You know, all sorts of stuff like that is determined by the ATX standard. Now, the original standard was AT. It stands for uh, Advanced Technology. Yep, that was the standard set by the IBM AT. <laughs> Ho-ho! Oh, there was a computer called the IBM AT. That's why we always talk about the places where we used to plug in mice and keyboards on computers before we invented USB are called PS2 ports, because those are the same ports that we had in the IBM PS2. Yeah, before that, we actually got a jackpot, well, I guess a jackpot is a relative term, <laughs> of like 20 or 30 AT-style keyboards. Or XT. Yeah, I think those were ATs. Yeah, but you know... Yeah, they used to call it the IBM AT or XT connector. Was It looked like a big PS2 port, and that's what they used to use to connect the keyboards and the mice to the mostly the keyboards. Yeah, we computers. got all those keyboards. We thought, oh, we'll sell them on eBay. And then a year went by, and we threw them all away. Yep. Like all those bikes we got, but that, that's a whole other story from the one time we thought dumpster diving was a good idea. Yep. But yeah, ATX has been and continues to be the primary standard for these things. Yep, since pretty much the mid-'90s when ATX took over as the standard. Yep. I mean, sure, there are some other standards. There's some BTXs out there. And... BTX is really only for, like, pre-built computers. And yeah. And don't worry about it. If you get a BTX computer, you didn't build it, so it doesn't matter. Yep. Uh, the thing is, BTX and other new standards actually offer a lot of things that ATX can't do. Mostly things like we position the CPU on the motherboard for better cooling uh, than ATX can offer and, and things like that. And it's actually better, but because the ATX standard is so ingrained and it's good enough, people tend to stick with it. And if they suddenly just stop making ATX stuff, a lot of people would be out in the lurch, a lot more than when they change CPU sockets or anything like that. So really, all you need to worry about now are ATX and micro ATX, and everything else you'll really not run into. Now, this mini ATX, but I don't know if that's different from micro or if they're the same. It doesn't really matter. I am reasonably certain that it's different. Yeah, okay. Anyway... Yeah, and very briefly, the only real difference is that micro-ATX is obviously smaller. And if you're building a gaming computer, you probably want an ATX motherboard because they use that extra space to put a lot of extra stuff on the motherboard. But if you're just making a computer for your grandma or a normal computer just for, you know, email, or a living internet, room computer. Yeah, anything that has to be small, anything that doesn't have to be super, super high performing, micro-ATX motherboards are pretty badass. Yeah, you can get a really good motherboard. It just will probably have, like, fewer connectors on it. So you might not get SLI, and you probably Oh, won't. you're not going to get SLI. I think there might actually be a few with SLI. You might not get uh, really good cooling because it's kind of small and it's going to be a little box. You might not get uh, a lot of connectors for a whole bunch of hard drives because a tiny case doesn't have room for a whole bunch of hard drives anyway. But you'll get a really small computer that does the job. So, you know... When you're building a computer, that's probably the first thing you have to decide is, is it going to be an ATX because I need a full on computer? Or can I go with the micro ATX because I'd rather have something smaller and quieter? Now, the other very important factor in a case is that one function it provides is cooling. Mm -hmm. It'll draw air in the front. It'll pull air out the back. Fans are usually arranged in a certain way to maximize cooling. Sometimes you have the blowhole in the side. There's extra exhaust in the top got to decide if you want a positive pressure or a negative pressure system, all those fun things. Yep. Basically, you want a computer that takes in lots of cold air from the outside of the computer, 
and pushes lots of hot air that the computer that the well air that the computer has made hot outside of the computer. Usually, you want exhaust fans in the top and in the back where the hot air is likely to be, and intake fans in the front and the bottom where there's not so much hot air in the computer, and you're gonna pull in air from the outside. See, in the early days, pretty much every case was the same, and there was always the one front air intake, and then the one back exhaust, and then the power supply, which you stick in there, acted as kind of an auxiliary exhaust. Well, the power supply has its own exhaust, because the power supply itself makes a lot of heat. Yeah, but it also drew air out of the rest of the computer, which was usually already hot, which probably contributed to a lot of those early power supply failures. Probably. Yeah, but generally, one rule is, you might think, oh, I want a lot more exhaust than I want intake. And in fact, a lot of earlier cases required that to work well, because they'd usually have along the sides and the front a giant vent that you couldn't put a fan on, but they expected the air to be pulled in from there. So you needed a lot of exhaust to pull air through and cool the whole case. Yep, because if you have a lot of exhaust, the air pressure outside the case is greater than the air pressure inside the case, and thus air will just push its way into your case on its own without any fan help. The problem with that is, of course, that dust goes right into the case because the dust will go in with the air. Well, more importantly, dust gets into the case from every single hole that the case has. Yep. This is why the new modern thinking is to have a positive pressure case where there is more intake than exhaust. The intake fans will pull in lots of air through a filter of some sort, which will collect all the dust, and the air pressure inside your case will be greater than the air pressure outside your case, and thus, dust really won't get in there so much. But you still will have enough exhaust to push the hot air in your case out, and yeah, your computer will stay cool. Now, it depends very much on what kind of case you have. So don't automatically go positive pressure. At least look at your case. Figure it out. You don't want to just fiddle with it. Cases are usually designed fairly specifically to be cooled in a certain way. And if you start putting fans in places where you weren't supposed to put fans, and they're facing the wrong direction, you're probably going to have some cooling trouble. Yep. So just your case will either come with fans or it will have spots where fans obviously go and it'll be obvious which direction those fans should be blowing. Just do whatever the case wants. The case knows best. The people designing the case figured it out. Now, the third and more recent use for a case is to show off your bling. Bling Bling-a-bling-a. You should see. I mean, a lot of cases now have windows in the side or cold cathode cathode tubes or they make noise or the fans have colors in them and... This is a relatively, in the last several years, new development. Cases yeah, I mean, used to all be the same color. Everyone used to get, like, the just the Enlight 8, 7, whatever it was called case, which is a plain beige box that was really good at holding your motherboard and really good at holding drives, and that it, it did its function correctly. And that was the case that people bought because it was cheap and it worked. And no one really cared if your case was some other color. But then, I don't know who did it, but they made a black computer. And people were like, ooh. And then someone decided to mod their case. They said, hey, you know what? I want to look at my computer while I'm using it. And they cut a hole in the side of their box, and they put a piece of plexiglass over it, and they could see into their computer. I wish I could find that original case mod. Yep. I remember seeing it on, like, Engadget or something. And it started this gigantic wave of people modding cases. Yep. People started modding cases left and right. So some genius entrepreneurs said, you know what? Much like the Honda Civic. We should start marketing certain kinds of cases to the people who want all that and make it easy for them to show off their bling. So So cases started coming with all these tubes in them. In fact, Scott's current case has blue lights on the inside. Yeah, it has a blue light and it has a clear window in the side. My next case probably will not have those things. Good. (laughs) Yeah, I don't know what I was thinking. Yeah, well, the case I'm getting now is the Antec P180 Silver Cold Rolled Steel. Mm. Thing weighs a fuck ton, but it's plain, it's steel, it looks sturdy, and it's got the power supply in the bottom instead of on top. Mm. It's kind of weird. A lot of people like that. I'm not sure if it's going to be good, but I'm going to roll with it. The only problem with it, I mean, it's obviously a better position. The only problem I can see is if the wires from the power supply can reach the rest of the computer from the bottom. Yep. Luckily, I bought an Antec power supply that I'm pretty sure will reach. Mm. And I see more people saying good things about the case than bad things. Yeah. So I it don't definitely think... looks like a quality case. Yeah. And the thing is, it's not super blingy because I really don't want to waste my precious wattages with lights and fancy bullshit. Yeah, well, the window on the case actually has a useful function that if there's something going on in the computer, I don't have to open it up to find out what the deal is. Yeah, I remember when I think your Northbridge fan stopped spinning and you never would have known that. Yep. 
But then I looked, and oh, look, my fan stopped spinning. That's no good. The, the, you, the window's useful. The light, not so useful. Well, even though most modern motherboards, you can find out rather easily if a, spin, if a fan stops spinning in software. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you have to have something set up to do that. and You know, it's not as easy as just looking with your eyeball. Ah. Yeah. Yeah, another important thing to note about cases is the material. All cases used to just be made out of steel and plastic. And that was okay for a time, but computers are heavy. And it really sucked. And it, it generally just sucked all around. I remember going to my first LAN party, and three of us crammed into my tiny little laser to drive to Southfield. So everyone except the driver sat with a monitor, a CRT, a gigantic CRT, in their lap. And the computers, which were gigantic, barely fit in the trunk. And my, my suspension could barely take it, and it totally sucked. Yep. Now, and they decided they would make cases out of, you know, they couldn't do just plastic. The problem with just plastic is you can't ground your motherboard on plastic. It needs to be grounded so that the aforementioned static shocks do not happen. Your case must form some sort of Faraday cage to protect your computer from the electrical elements. Even though mine currently definitely does not. Yes, but a total plastic case does not work. So they need some sort of metal, and thus the aluminum case. or the- Aluminium. Yep. They make lots of aluminum cases now, or aluminum alloys, or various other metals, which are just as protective from the elements. They look better sometimes, and they're much lighter, so you can pick your computer up and move it around. Yep, and also a lot of cases are LAN party ready now. Well, Not only will they be small and compact and ready to go and look really cool, but they usually have carrying cases. You can buy special... Or like, handles. Backpack things to carry them around with you. Yep. All right, so, Rim, when you're looking for a case... How do you decide which case is good and which case is not so good? Well, when I was young and inexperienced, I would get the biggest case I could afford that had the most possible places to put things. My current case has spots for two power supplies, because I always thought that someday I'll fill this case with drives and I'll get another power supply just for them. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, technology. And you'll only ever need 460k of RAM. (laughs) Yeah, nowadays, really... To me, I want a case that's small. I want a mid tower. I don't want some gigantic tower with a million things. Yeah, I've only that. ever bought mid towers, but yeah. Yeah, well, I've only ever bought full towers. Uh, I'd actually like something smaller than a mid tower, but they just won't fit everything I want in there. What I really want is ease of access and ease of installation. Mm-hmm. I want a case where I can pull the hard drive cage out, fill it up with hard drives, and put it back in. Yep. I want a case where all the fans and all the hard drives are mounted on rails with Freaking rubber grommets, so I don't make noise. One thing I hated always was whenever my hard drive spun up on any case until modern ones, they'd rattle, they'd make noise. Now, all good cases, anything that moves is mounted on rubber, so you don't get that vibration noise coming out. Yep. Yeah, generally, if you're building a computer, you want a case that makes building a computer a pleasure. I mean, if you look at like a lot of old computers, like it ones totally that were pre-built, sucks. you open those up, it basically sucked to build the computer with that case because it was hard to get drives in there, uh, screws didn't fit, holes weren't in the right places, uh, it was very difficult to get the motherboard into the case, uh, uh, you couldn't get the power supply in or out, the power supply was part of the case, all sorts of terrible things. The, all the edges inside the case are very sharp, and you'd cut yourself, and you'd bleed, and blood on the motherboard means a dead motherboard. Yep, good God, I think we all learned that lesson. Yeah, so you want a case that has... Nice, sturdy, well-measured parts that are easy to access, easy to get to, easy to work with. Lots of toolless entry that just works. You don't want flimsy crap, but, you, you know, you want something that's like, all right, this is going to let me install the motherboard by sliding out a tray. Put the motherboard in the tray all nice and easy. Slide the tray back in. Nice and easy to add cards to the computer. Just one screw in and out. Yep, slide the drives in on little rails, easy to take them in and out. Don't have to sit there, like, unscrewing a drive, then pulling on it for, like, ten minutes, <laughs> trying to get it out of there. In fact, in my current computer case, there is not one, but two dead hard drives that I would basically have to take the entire case apart to get out, so I just left them in there. Wow, yeah. And I have two other hard drives stacked on top of them. Yep. Another thing I look for is quietness. As Rim said, the rubber grommets on the moving parts help a lot. But the most important thing when getting a quiet computer is the, the fans themselves. Very simply, you want large, slow fans much more than you want small, fast fans. Yep. I mean, think about it. A small, fast fan makes a lot of noise, has high RPMs to push a lot of air. 
if you have a bigger fan, you can lower the RPM and lower the noise while still pushing the same quantity of air. So why would you ever use a smaller fan? Well, if you were stupid. Or your case was so small it couldn't accommodate a small, a big fan. But that's a damn small case right there. Luckily, most modern cases take very large fans now. That seems to be the trend. Cases are getting better constantly. The cases I look at now, even the cheap ones. Like, you can go out and get a $20 case now. That's actually pretty cool. It's better than my current case, and my current case cost me $120 when I bought it. Yeah, I still wouldn't buy the $20 cases now, because they're probably made out of cheap plastic, and they'll cut your arms up when you try to work with them. It's worth it to spend between $100 and $150 on a good case. Uh, if you... Oh, if you're only going to build the computer once, I'd say it's only worth maybe 50 or 60. But if you're the kind of person who opens the case all the time to do all sorts of things, you definitely want to spend 100 bucks or more to get a case that's easy to work with. I don't know. It's worth the $50, even if I'm building it once and I don't plan to do much in it. To have a case that feels solid, looks good, I can get access to if I ever need to, and that's a pleasure to build. I hate having to route cables around under things and my video card doesn't fit because the fan's in the way and the hard drives don't fit because the case was manufactured and engineered poorly. Yeah, that, that can piss you off, but if it's only going to piss you off once in your life and it'll be over with soon, then I think you could, it's you don't have to spend so much Well, more there's money. also the problem that cheap cases tend to just break. That is true. I mean, I, look at the case I have had a little cheap plastic flap in front of the front USB ports. That plastic flap is gone. It's totally gone. It's never coming back. <laughs> Forget about it. And how many other cases have I seen that are made of some cheap... They have some, like, fancy plastic bezel in the front. And, and over time, it just cracks and chips away into a million pieces or shatters or whatever because it's some cheap piece of crap or, you know, some metal on the inside gets bent and warps and now you can't get something out of there. It, it's, you know, cheap stuff is cheap stuff. You get what you pay for. Now, while it's very much related, and most people, when they buy one, they buy the other at the same time, or you buy them in a set, but the power supply goes in the case. Not going to really talk about the power supply, because it's actually kind of complicated and difficult to give good advice when it comes to what kind of power supply I don't even know a power supply to buy these days. You know how long it took me to figure out how many watts I needed for my new computer? It used to be easy. Now, not so easy anymore. Yeah, it used to be real easy. Every computer took generally the same wattage. Yep. But now with the SLI and the many, many, many hard drives, and, well, if you're using an AMD, the processor, not so much of an issue with Intel anymore. Yeah, but it generally sucks to figure out what uh, power supply you need, but generally, many cases will come with a power supply. S some don't, and then you have to go buy your own. So it's just a common pairing that, that you'll see. Yep, so and be, definitely factor it in. Yeah, when you're shopping for a case, make sure you check and see if the case comes with a power supply or not. Because you might want it to, you might not want it to, but don't go buying a power supply you didn't want, and don't go buying an empty case and then not having a power supply. Yeah, especially if a power supply that would suit your needs plus some other case is 100 bucks, or the case you like is 100 bucks, and you forget that now you got to drop another 100 bucks on a power supply. Yep, yep. Just something to watch out for, people. Yep. However, power supplies, much like cases, you get what you pay for. You're generally better off spending a little bit more money to get something that you can probably trust a little bit more. Yeah, but you're also got to be wary of a lot of scam power supplies where they say a whole bunch of marketing speak and the, the power supply is really not any better than yep. any other one. A uh, little hint, you don't need a 900 watt power supply yet. That's pretty much guaranteed. All right, so that should inform everyone about the uh, trials and tribulations of computer chassis and cases. One we should most... probably do a show in the future on all the actual tricks of, you know, how to get jumpers into the right places. Yeah. Not so much on the motherboard, but when you're putting a computer together. Yeah. Or how to route cables properly. Yep. So now you should know, if you're thinking about building a computer or whatever, uh, how to buy a case that will suit your needs. And how to not buy some piece of junk that will make your life miserable. Basically, just look on Newegg, look at cases, find one that looks good, look at the pictures of the inside. Don't read the specs, other than making sure it has the number of things you need. Look at the case itself. Look at pictures of it. Does it look like it's easy to take apart? Does it look like the cages come out? Look at the reviews. People who have problems will tell you they have problems. Believe me, they will. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, computer case. Perhaps one of the most important parts of the computer. And yet often the most overlooked piece. Yep. This has been Geek Nights with Rim and Scott. Special thanks to DJ Pretzel for the opening music. Be sure to visit our website at www.frontroadcrew.com 
where you'll find show notes, links, our awesome forum, a link to our Frapper map, and links to all the RSS feeds. We say feeds plural because Geek Nights airs four nights a week covering four different brands of geekery. Mondays are science and technology. Tuesdays, we have video games, board games, and RPGs. Wednesdays are anime, manga, comic nights. And Thursdays are the catch-alls for various rants and tomfoolery. You can send us feedback by email to geeknights at frontrowcrew.com. Or you can send audio feedback via Odeo. Just click the link that says send me an audio on the right side of our website. If you like what you hear, you can catch the last 100 episodes in iTunes or in your favorite podcatcher. For the complete archives, visit the website, which has everything. Geek Nights is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 2.5 license. This means you can do whatever you want with it as long as you give us credit, don't make money, and share it in kind. Geek Nights is recorded live with no studio and no audience. But unlike those other late shows, it's actually recorded at night.